Good afternoon. For those of you that have just joined us for um, this webinar, um, welcome and good afternoon. My name is Jamoya Cox. I'm from the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. I have with me Simone Crawley uh, from the Multi-Ethnic Advocates uh, for Cultural Competency. Uh, today we're going to be doing a, a, a training, a presentation brought to you uh, through the Ohio Cultural and Linguistic Competency Network. Um, that focuses on implementing the national class standards uh, with a focus on theme one. Before we get started, just a, a few logistics. Um, everyone will remain muted and so throughout the duration of this presentation. However, there will be an opportunity towards the end of the presentation to ask questions. If you look at your control panel to the right, uh, if you look further at the bottom, there is an opportunity to ask questions. And what we'll do is uh, as questions are asked towards the end, um, I will field those questions and present those back to the group as a whole to give our presenters an opportunity to uh, present out or respond to those questions. The purpose of our presentation today is to uh, continue to move forward with an overall approach to address uh, disparities, health equity, cultural and linguistic competency. And so this is another step in that direction to address uh, some of those issues and concerns. I'm having a, some technical challenges with the, so I'm going to go, while I'm, while I'm um, waiting on this computer to scroll through, um, our PowerPoint slides. Um, the agenda today is going to be, I'm going to give you an overview of kind of what the department's approach is to um, health equity and what we've been trying to do over the last few years to address that through our Disparities and Cultural Competency Advisory Committee. Um, but with that, you're going to hear a presentation from uh, Scott Silick, the Executive Director of the M Mental Health and Recovery Services Board uh, of Lucas County. Uh, we also have uh, presenting today Dr. Patricia uh, Boston, and she's the project director for Children's Mental Health Systems of Care Expansion Implementation. And then last but not least, we're certainly going to hear from Simone Crawley, and she is the project coordinator with the Multi-Ethnic Advocates for Cultural Competency. Okay, slides are now working. So just a quick um, list of what our learning objectives are today. You're going to hear from the presenters, and what they're going to do is kind of describe what their current practices are uh, regarding the standards located in Theme 1, which is the focus of today. Um, they're going to highlight the development of new policies, procedures, guidelines, administra administrative roles, et cetera. We're also going to take a look at those factors that supported and promoted the implementation of these standards. And then they're going to describe those factors that were barriers to implementing these standards. And of course, discuss some of the resources and assistance that they feel will be needed kind of moving forward. And so the whole idea is that as you listen to them present, um, they have a really a wealth of information that shows um, kind of what their uh, vision has been and where that's going to kind of self-examine where you are as an organization or as an individual uh, being an advocate um, and looking to kind of uh, look at uh, operationalizing these standards. And that's what we hope that you can take from this today. Just some ideas on what you can do in, the, in this uh, theme one to address that. So a lot of the work that we're doing now through class standards really comes out of uh, some work that began a few years ago uh, with the forming of the Disparities in Cultural Competency Advisory Committee. It was through that group, um, which included the participation of statewide organizations. Uh, we had the participating also other state agencies, uh, some ca cabinet level, some commissions, um, as well as in a, a good cross systems of uh, 
uh, internal folks. We also had leadership participate in this effort. And so what we came up with were four major objectives, but one of the most important objectives that we came up with was the development of a five-year strategic plan. And in that plan, we identified some specific strategic uh, objectives around class. <coughs> Excuse me. Two of which, uh, we have about six uh, specific goal areas within that strategic plan, but two of those uh, strategic goal areas included a focus on class standards. So for example, in uh, one of our goal areas, awareness, which includes uh, increasing the awareness of, and significance of health disparities and behavioral health, their impact on the state and the actions necessary to improve behavioral health outcomes for racial, ethnic, and underserved populations, we came up with a strategy to, uh, for that to implement a workforce development training plan inclusively of federal health disparities in Ohio cultural competency division definition. So the whole idea was to make sure that we kind of cross-pollinated on specific terms that could be used at the local level so that we're all speaking the same language. And as you see in the, um, in the slide, we also wanted to kind of get our employees internally to learn and understand what those specific key terminology uh, pieces were, but also what the class standards were and the implications of class. We also wanted to ensure that as we look at that internally that we request that boards and provider agencies kind of take the same uh, steps within that process. The second area that I wanted to speak to regarding what that includes uh, implementing the class standards within our strategic plan is cultural linguistic competency. And again, that's just an improved CLC and the diversity of the behavioral health workforce. It also included uh, with a strategy to develop and support a diverse behavioral health workforce and ensure cultural linguistic competency that is sensitive and reflective of the cultural and language variations of diverse communities. And so ultimately, aside from training, we wanted organizations, we wanted ourselves, we wanted everyone to look at adopting and implementing the standards, um, each kind of looking at what that looks like for their individual organizations. And secondly, kind of looking at within that spectrum, um, looking at recruiting, training, uh, training and retrain, retaining a diverse staff. Uh, both at the, at the state level but at board and provider agency level um, at all professional administrative levels that is reflective of the population being served. So that kind of sums up um, some of the key pieces of class within our uh, five-year strategic plan. There's some other things going on that I'll probably talk about a little later. Um, but this is just to give you a sense of what those themes are. You may have participated in a, in a in a training uh, earlier in the fall or, or sometime this year. So to that extent, you would know that there are about three themes. Um, one theme focusing on governance, leadership, and workforce. Theme two for focusing on uh, communication and language assistance. Uh, theme three focusing on engagement, continuous improvement, and accountability. The one theme that's missing, it's really technically there's four themes. But the first is actually the principal standard. And once you, have, once you achieve all of the themes that I just mentioned, you kind of achieve the principal standard. Uh, so that's why I didn't list that um, as a theme. And so within the theme that we're going to talk about today around the governance, governance leadership, and workforce, um, we have three specific standards. The first is to advance and sustain organizational governance and leadership that promotes class and health equity through policy practices and allocated resources. Uh, the third standard within this theme is to recruit, promote, and support a culturally and linguistically diverse governance, uh, leadership, and workforce that are responsive to the population in the service area. And number four is to educate and train governance, leadership, and workforce in culturally and linguistically appropriate policies, practices, and on an ongoing basis. So today we have um, some a few very good presenters, um, both of which I've worked with in different capacities. Uh, the first presenter today uh, is Scott Silek, and uh, he is the executive director of the Mental Health Recovery Services Board of Lucas County. 
Uh, since joining the board in December 2010, he has focused his efforts on improving and expanding behavioral health services provided to all Lucas County residents. For the 18 years prior to this appointment, he was a uh, founding executive director of Lucas County Treatment Alternatives to Street Crimes, a Toledo native. Uh, he received a Master of Public Administration in 1990 from the University of Toledo, and he's a licensed independent chemical dependency counselor. In addition to being a current member of many local workshops and committees, Mr. Silek is an active is active at the state level as an executive member of the Ohio Association of County Behavioral Health Authorities and the Ohio Justice Alliance for Community Corrections. Um, with that, I give to you all Scott Seiler. Well, thank you, Jamoy. I appreciate the opportunity and appreciate the folks that have uh, signed in today uh, to, to hear the presentation. Um, you might hear me stalling just a little bit as we get our uh, presentation up and running. I uh, want to also uh, express my appreciation to Dr. Boston. I'm looking forward to participating on this webinar with, with her as well. Uh, and, and let's not forget about uh, Simone Crawley from MAC, uh, um, a wealth of information coming out of, of that group. And, and we can all learn more about uh, class standards and how to implement them locally. I always like to start out these presentations by talking a little bit about uh, what the Mental Health and Recovery Services Board in Lucas County's role is. Uh, and uh, in doing so, I uh, want to make sure that my slides are rolling through. Here we go. Um, first of all, I, I'm not familiar with, or I'm, I, I, don't, I don't really know how much folks are familiar with our role in the system, but um, we are the board that is responsible for community need, uh, assessing community needs in order to set priorities and determine the types of services and programs, facilities that are needed to provide behavioral health services within our uh, county. We also are responsible to plan the uh, system of care for persons uh, who, who need mental health and addiction services, and, and, and as many of you know, that also includes gambling services. Uh, we're responsible to collaborate with family members, consumers, providers, and, and really all of our stakeholders around our, our community and the state that, that help develop uh, and identify needs uh, and the components necessary to ensure that we're offering high quality, cost effective, age appropriate, and culturally competent services. Uh, a big thing of what we do is we fund to the extent resources are available, a continuum of services that provides, uh, that includes prevention, treatment, and support services. We monitor uh, services. We review and audit our contract providers for the delivery of those services through programmatic and fiscal monitoring via on-site and compliance reviews. And then finally, we evaluate program outcomes to ensure we're investing in evidence-based quality services in the most efficient and effective uh, manner to ensure that we're being good stewards of public dollars. So in essence, the board funds 84 treatment prevention and support programs encompassing 22 agencies in 36 locations. Uh, it's important to note, I think, for the context of this presentation that 18 of those 36 locations are in zip codes, which are associated with um, high poverty uh, rates and um, significant minority representation within our community. Um, in addition, the board will allocate nearly uh, 20, over $21 million uh, this fiscal year, and, and like many of the last fiscal years, we actually have three separate property tax levies that help us generate these funds. Uh, and 93% of every dollar that we collect from our community's property tax levies goes directly to uh, the 22 agencies that I, that I indicated or the provision of services. Uh, as by rule, uh, actually Ohio law, the boards cannot provide direct services uh, to, to providers. And so clearly you can see that um, we are in a position to impact the implementation and uh, uh, overall development of class standards within our communities. And specifically, uh, advancing and sustaining governance and leadership that promotes class and health equity 
recruiting, promoting, and supporting the diverse governance, leadership, and workforce, and then educating, training, uh, governance, leadership, and the workforce regarding class. Um, you know, we have the ability to substantively advance these goals with the influence as, as uh, using our influence as a convener, a facilitator, and a funder. Um, but to understand where we're at in this process, I think it's important that you understand our community a bit. Uh, we are the sixth largest county in the state. Our county seat is uh, Toledo, and Toledo um, is home to roughly, I think it's about 70% of the entire population of Lucas County. Um, our median household income is about $41,000, and about 21% of our population live below the poverty level. Our major economic, uh, 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 our economy is largely driven by manufacturing, medical, and technology, uh, and education. We have about 10 hospitals here. We have a major public school system, to the public schools, uh, as well as a, a number of minor ones, and then two major universities. But I think what we're most interested in today is about their population. Um, the, the latest uh, 2013 census indicated that about 70% of our population is uh, white, 19.5% uh, black, 6.5% uh, Hispanic, and then as you can see, 2.7% other races, uh, and then 1% uh, other. Those are the numbers I want you to keep in mind as we move forward in the discussion. Um, but I, I got to tell you, we're relatively new to the game of uh, um, implementing class standards and um, discussing at a, a public level inclusion, diversity, and health equity. And um, you know, the the reality is is that while we were always concerned about developing culturally competent services and measuring you know workforce and uh, um, um, percentages, and and uh, we were concerned about access and that kind of stuff. Um, a, a tipping point occurred uh, when we were actively promoting one of our renewal levies back in October of 14, and we became criticized uh, by a fairly prominent member in our minority community regarding um, our failure to do more to advance minority leadership opportunities among our contracted agencies. Uh, in response to that, uh, criticism. The, the, the trustees, uh, our board trustees, uh, which is made up of uh, 18 residents of Lucas County that are appointed by the state and our local county commissioners, we pledged to develop a, a, a diversity work group to investigate the concerns. So in 2015, led by one of our board uh, trustees, the, the work group was formed to review and make recommendations for improving the uh, diversity-related uh, policies and practices of the board and its funded system of care. Specifically, we thought the work group um, would address issue to issues relative to diversity and cultural sensitivity, policy formation, implementation, data collection, and reporting, uh, among other issues. The board would, or the, the work group would report uh, final recommendations to our full board uh, in either uh, right around the February of 2016 um, deadline. And um, so far, the group has met 10 times as a body. And we have three other sub work groups functioning uh, in various capacities. I uh, want to discuss a little bit about the, the membership of the group itself. We are um, currently you can see that uh, it's a fairly diverse group of folks that are participating. And, and while there are 32 individual people, if you added up the, the numbers that are on your screen, you'll know that it uh, exceeds 32 because there's a lot of overlap. For instance, um, one of our trustees, uh, of which there are four participating, is also a pastor. So. Um, you know, we have four trustees from the board that are participating, and um, what's important to note about that is they are all prominent members of our trustees. 
They are in decision-making capacities. Our board chair, our two committee, uh, committee chairs are, are on the committee, and also our board secretary is on the uh, committee as well. Uh, in addition, we have five of our executive leadership staff um, uh, participating. We have higher education, we have human resources professionals, contracted providers, um, of which are both large contracted providers with over a thousand employees and small contracted providers that um, might only have two or three. We have workforce development professionals, um, peer agencies like developmental disabilities professionals, law enforcement, um, union, uh, NAACP and the such. Um, to give you an understanding of, of what we've been taking on, um, you know, and, and by the way, when I say that, we are currently in the process. So I don't want to be coming off as we know everything that's going on in relation to this in our communities. We are learning just like everybody else. Um, uh, we've just kind of taken it one step further and are, are actively engaging in the process. Um, and we hope that we can be seen as a potential um, mentor to other communities uh, that, that hope to uh, take this work on. So, you know, the, 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 the activities of the work group, I mentioned that the work group and its subcommittees have met um, uh, at least 10 times already. Um, but we felt it was really important that once we first worked or began our work, that we looked internally at our own operations before we turned ourselves outward and began looking at our contractors uh, um, that, that we fund. So, um, so besides looking at Ohio Revised Code Section 340, which is the authorizing legislation of the board, we looked at uh, some of our more prominent policies related to uh, the implementation of class standards and you know, inclusion, diversity, and health equity. Primarily, uh, we talk about policies of equal employment opportunity, affirmative action program plan, recruiting and hiring, how we do all that, staff evaluation and development, because it's not only about bringing folks on that are um, diverse, it's also about providing development and opportunity uh, um, for pr promotion. And then just board organization, um, how our trustee appointments occur. Um, and I think it's also important to note at that point that um, our board trustee appointments, while they are governed by, um, 10 are actually made by the county commissioners and eight are by the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. And as you can see by the numbers, I have two vacancies right now. Ohio Revised Code actually indicates that our board trustees will reflect um, as to gender and race the latest census. So we're very cognizant of that fact. And if you recall um, what our numbers looked like uh, several slides ago in relation to county population, you'll see that we are very close um, to uh, reflecting uh, board composition in relation to race. Um, our our uh, black or African American trustees are uh, represented at 31%, Hispanic at 13, and white 56. And then also, you know, we looked at our board composition, our staff, um, uh, 18 full-time staff members, 27.7% uh, black, 5.5% Hispanic, and 60 seven percent essentially um, are white um, you know and, and so while those numbers don't uh, th those numbers re uh, reflect reflect fairly our um, uh, the way our uh, population in our community uh, is uh, organized I guess we are um, always cognizant to look at other avenues of, of uh, what we can do better, and, and also how do we maintain and, and improve our diversity, and what other elements are we missing within our uh, um, board, board makeup and, and um, staff uh, in, in addition to just race um, that are reflected in the class standards. So 
But we continue to work on those things. We also looked at how do we contract. As I indicated, we we um, we allocate nearly 21, just over 21 million dollars annually. And um, you know, uh, uh, so we looked at our contract agencies, trustees, their leadership, and we found that um, while they are fairly um, consistent with what our um, community census is looking like, um, there's always room for improvements uh, at the, the trustee level and uh, the staff level. Now one of the things that, that was interesting when we started to really break down the staff level, um, we found that um, there were a couple of different um, positions within those staff levels that we really need to take a better look at. And one of those was agency leadership uh, and the other one was direct clinical services work. And I'll just give you a good example of, of what I mean by that. Um, you can see that uh, on the contract agency staff, well, we, we are identifying that 5% of the individuals um, are Hispanic that work at agencies. But when you start to really drill down on who is actually providing the clinical service, uh, we're finding that uh, only uh, about 2.5% of the clinical workers are providing um, direct service, and then a good portion of those are not. Um, um, uh, they 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 don't uh, they, they aren't able to communicate effectively with individuals that have uh, um, um, speak a language other than than English. So there's obviously some work to do. The other thing I wanted to point out in that area is that you know by revised code um, prevention treatment and support services are exempt from the competitive bidding process. Um, so when we really start to talk about how our board resources, our public dollars are um, um, dispersed, uh, only uh, about two million dollars of our board overall budget of 25 million dollars is actually falls under any kind of competitive bidding process. And when you boil that down, it's only really about $130,000 that is actually um, let out in an administrative contract, of which 70% of those dollars actually go to an MBE or EDGE contractor. And, and while I think everybody's familiar with um, minority business enterprise, I'm not sure everybody's uh, familiar with what EDGE means. And in fact, I had to look it up as well. Um, so I'll just share with you that it's encouraging diversity, growth, and equity, which seems pretty relevant to what we're discussing. So you know the criticism that was um, being let um, you know placed upon us uh, during the October 14 um, uh, process. While I'm not really sure that the numbers substantiated the criticism, it certainly gave us an opportunity to look at these numbers differently. And in fact, you know, we began to ask the question, okay, we get that uh, MBE and EDGE contracting doesn't really apply um, for a couple of different reasons, um, one of which MBE and EDGE definitions don't apply to nonprofit corporations. How do I determine how a nonprofit corporation uh, uh, is minority-led and does that change with leadership and board? Um, we began to really think differently about um, how do we define those uh, those entities so that we can actually put a, a, a number to it um, and report that to our community leaders? And it's important to understand that number because uh, our system of care really does uh, provide a significant number of services to the African American community, 36.7% in fiscal year 14. And that number is fairly consistent in 15. And as you know, we're right in the middle of state fiscal year 16. So, so we have no reason to believe that those numbers will change very much. But we do know that we are serving more people. Um, thank you to Medicaid expansion. And, we, uh, and, and so we need to be cognizant of these numbers. And, and um, you know, the, as you reflect on what our community census looks like, you'll see that we are um, African Americans are overrepresented in our system. Um, 
And you know, I think some of that could be related to um, provider location. As I indicated, over half of our agencies are in in um, zip codes known to uh, um, house a disproportionate number of African Americans. But also, um, sadly to say, uh, our primary referral source is the criminal justice system. And um, you know, I, I'll talk a little bit about the overrepresentation of African Americans in the criminal justice system um, in a in a bit. Um, we are, um, you know, bringing you know. So so this group has been developing, and you know, once we began to foray into looking at our contracted providers, we we began to explore what. Uh, what what we would be identifying as those class standards and 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 frankly um, our group was in the dark about class standards until a very enlightening presentation by Jamoya uh, last August in which it all came together for us before we were kind of struggling through um, uh, how to look at uh, class service standards um, without using the definitions that appeared in the standards themselves. So we were looking at things like language, staff diversity, location, what kind of tools. But really when Jamoya came in and um, presented not only the class standards but the business case, it really clicked with our group in relation to what we we needed to do next. And it, and it gave us some purpose. In, in moving forward. The, you know, in, in addition to looking at our outcome or our um, uh, external factors, we also wondered about how does um, diversity impact our outcomes? And, uh, you know, we soon understood that the, op the, the, the way we currently collected data precluded our ability to look at race, gender, or culture in relation to outcomes and services. We had some elementary um, view, uh, view of outcomes related to hospitalizations um, and uh, in particular, uh, but you know, we couldn't identify general success in treatment uh, in relation to, to, to race. We, we could modestly look at satisfaction in relation to were, the, were groups disproportionately filing grievances at the agency level or client complaints at the agency level. But the reality is, is those numbers are so low that I would, I would be concerned about using them across the system to make decisions. And um, what we find in using grievances and complaints as a, a indicator is really that those numbers are somewhat driven by one or two individuals that um, um, had extreme displeasure with one or two of our providers. So, so we, re we really need to think differently about the way we collect this data and use the data. So we spent a great deal of discussion on client perceptions of care and cultural competence. Um, we actually formed a sub work group to 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 look at client perceptions and and we uh, utilized the uh, some of the work that had already been done um, with uh, for instance SAMHSA had a race and ethnic uh, differences in mental health services use among adults um, and also the consumers perception of quality competent community services and treatment outcomes that the Ohio Department of Mental Health uh, had um, completed in 2012 gave us the um, um, confidence to, to, to know that we could move forward with some level of client perception survey locally that would help us um, identify uh, outcomes as they relate to cultural competence uh, at a more grassroots level. And in fact, uh, we anticipate um, implementing that client perception survey within our major provider network um, this spring using the um, uh, 
uh, interns at one of our local colleges, uh, St. Lord, uh, Lord's University. So, so we really uh, and 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 one under the leadership of one of our work group members. Um, we also, as I indicated previously, um, look took a pretty close look at the role criminal justice plays in our system, and um, we are in in our community right now. We are in the process of criminal justice reform, and a, and a portion of that reform is really getting down to looking at the elements behind disproportionate minority contact uh, and, and how that impacts our system. And as you can see uh, with, with this uh, slide, the, the likelihood of arrest as compared to whites, we see that African Americans are six and a half percent uh, greater opportunity uh, or likelihood to be arrested in Lucas County. Um, Hispanics have a 1.35 greater uh, likelihood and uh, all the other minorities have a 1.4, uh, sorry, 0.14 uh, less likelihood of being arrested. Um, so, so, so clearly there's some room that our community in general needs to do in relation to reducing disproportionate minority contact. But that also um, impacts our system because 36% of all of our treatment referrals come from the criminal justice system. So um, I think that there is a nexus between criminal justice referrals and the number of individuals being served in our community. Um, and, and the next step that, that I want you to see there is, um, so we, we started to drill down on that locally and we, and we said, okay, for people that are in our system, um, what are their contacts with the criminal justice system? And we found that um, of the African American population that was currently in our system, 47% had some contact with um, law enforcement, meaning they were arrested at one point in their lifetime. Um, and 7% as compared to 7% for Hispanic and 44% for white. So um, we clearly had a, a, a strong connection with the criminal justice system. And then for those of you that are unfamiliar, NGRI stands for not guilty by reason of insanity. Um, we wanted to know uh, what percentage of people in our system um, were found guilty um, or not guilty by um, reason of insanity. Uh, and so uh, African Americans represented 40% of that population, Hispanics 8 and 45% um, were Caucasian. Now, uh, we're still processing those numbers and we're still in the throes of what should we do about that? But I think one of the things that come from those numbers is the reality that we can do a better job of creating diversion opportunities and those diversion opportunities that we do create um, could potentially impact positively the, the, the number of individuals that are um, referred through the criminal justice system, clearly by the fact that we'll avoid those criminal justice contacts. Um, as a highlight to this, uh, I, wa I want to share this last stat with you that African Americans make up 49% of all the arrests in Lucas County, regardless of the jurisdiction, account for 62% of all offenders sent to prison, but just 34% of all offenders accepted for diversion. So um, clearly there's some disparities there that our community needs to work on and we are committed to doing that. Um, now, some of those things I don't control. Obviously, a lot of those things I don't control as the executive director of the Mental Health and Recovery Services Board. But there are things within my control. Um, and so I wanted to highlight a little bit about some of our actions taken to, to, to date. Um, first, we have recently hired, and actually she's sitting right next to me listening to this presentation, a manager of inclusion and health equity to chaperone and to guide the implementation of the class standards 
um, and the recommendations that come out of any of the reporting process of our, our diversity work group. We've done simple things like we've added Google Translate to our website. Uh, we've attended the, the class trainings at, uh, uh, at our Northwest Ohio Psychiatric Hospital this summer. Uh, we've translated key documents into Spanish. We've increased advertising to minority newspapers when we're you know, promoting events and uh, recruiting board members and staff. Uh, we, we actually hired a, a Spanish-speaking staff member. Um, and we're working on establishing a vocal link contract for our entire system so there is a consistent process in which translation services can be obtained no matter, regardless of what entity you walk in the door um, to. We've engaged our uh, LGBTQQIA uh, community, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, uh, queer questioning, intersex, and uh, asexual. And yes, that is my timer for the 30 sec or 30 minutes going off that I apologize for, but I'm going to keep going and uh, finish out. We are octo actually actively engaged in the Welcome Toledo Lucas County initiative, which is a, um, a county-wide um, effort to make uh, and develop, I guess, to develop our community as a welcoming community for um, uh, all populations as an enhancement for uh, placement for any uh, immigrants that might be immigrating into uh, Ohio. Um, and, and it's being um, developed as an economic development tool. Um, as I indicated previously, we have initiated additional criminal justice diversion programming. And one of the things that uh, are really unique to our action is we will be working to define inclusive and diverse contract agencies. And that will likely involve using the class self-evaluation tool in some manner um, and develop some kind of base level scorecard so that we can measure ongoing progress um, of, of not only ourselves but our agencies um, so that we can we can show actual movement on implementation of the class standards uh, diversity inclusion health equity um, so finally uh, the report is uh, the work group is actually winding down its work it will transition into an oversight role and meet quarterly as opposed to monthly. Um, its recommendations will include um, elements of accountability, education and training, sustainability, partnerships that are needed, recruiting, benchmarking and reporting, language, um, and whatever else uh, comes to the committee's mind. Um, we will report these recommendations to our governance committee in February with likely full voting of our official board in March and then um, agency level implementation beginning with July 2016 contract years. So um, let me catch up on my st steps here I guess um, you know that pretty much um, finalizes where I'm at and um, I will be happy to answer any of the questions uh, at the end, and at this point, I'll turn it back to Jamoya. Thanks, Scott. Um, I just want to commend you for the work that's being done um, in Lucas County. I mean, you all are doing a phenomenal job on, you know, making some of the, the steps that I believe are going to result in some systems change. Um, you know, collaborating, uh, you know, you've offered, you know, some really key insight on collaboration, looking at social determinants to kind of form program development, looking at the, the workforce and what changes you can meaning, meaningfully make based on demographic data, and last, certainly not least, looking at disparities and helping those to shape um, also how you frame programmatic development. 
So this is great work that you've been doing. I think we have a few questions. So I'm going to take a look at those questions. And one of the questions uh, includes out of the 32 members of the LCDW, uh, is anyone a language access expert? And I think that came from Natasha Curtis. Um. I'm not quite sure what you would define as language access expert. That's a new term on me, uh, for me. Um, I can tell you that there are um, several folks around the group that are very concerned with um, the cultural competence of our org uh, client serving organizations and how the lack of presenting information in a language that somebody um, is open to, to not open to, is, is is able to understand and and familiar with how that impacts their ability to engage appropriately with our services. Uh, that that is why we've been um, uh, promoting the Vocalink contract. Um, because that has 120 different languages uh, that are available in real time for people that are walking in the door. Um, but we recognize that um, there are as much more as a community we can do beyond just waiting for somebody to come to us. And so we're still, those are some of the things that we're hoping that the class uh, self-evaluation tool will pull out of how our agencies are doing this and what we might do then to incentivize the development of, of those outreach efforts. Thanks, Scott. And I think I'm going to go with one more question before we continue on with the presentation. Uh, and that question is, is Google Translate confidential when used? Um, Google Translate um, is I'm not really sure what we don't use it in a confidential process we use it to um, translate elementary elements of our website so that at least initial base level information can be shared in a native language um, for confidential documents um, we would take it to the next level and the plan would be is to use the Vocalink contract to translate those types of documents um, and obviously having some standard translations for for instance um, Spanish on uh, already completed so um, you know if you just go Google Translate is um, not the end-all be-all to translation services actually it's fairly elementary it'll just translate what's in your web page it won't translate documents that you load into your web page. So you got to be real careful on how you promote that use. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Scott. Um, thanks again for such a comprehensive uh, overview and presentation of some of the great work going on uh, at your board. Um, certainly, uh, we're glad at the department that you're able to participate um, in our Disparities in Cultural Competency Advisory Committee meeting and um, certainly I'll share a little bit about that with the group later on in the discussion. Uh, so thank you. Um, now turning to our next presenter, uh, Dr. Patricia Boston, uh, whom I met through a, a national cultural and linguistic competency uh, work through the uh, National Georgetown uh, Cultural Competency Center focusing on class standards and they've been doing some excellent work around implementation and I'll provide a little brief overview of that. Before I do, I just wanted to let everyone on the call know that Wilson Forney, who was supposed to be presenting today, um, had something come up and unfortunately will not be presenting and he was from the Family Health Services Center in Erie County. Uh, back to Dr. Boston. Uh, she works for the Florida Department of F 
for the uh, she works for the Florida Department of Families Substance Abuse and Mental Health Program Office as the project director for Children's Mental Health System of Care Expansion and Implementation. Uh, she participated in the development of the Florida Cultural and Linguistic Competence Planning Team and the Florida Cultural and Linguistic Competence Committee. Dr. Boston is coordinating development of a Florida CLC strategic plan to be presented to state leadership and a CLC governance document for providers. She's a member of the National Technical Assistance Center for Children's Health uh, Learning Community on implementation of the national class standards in behavioral health and has presented Florida's implementation experience at various conferences and workshops. Dr. Boston is a trained public health professional and also a SAMHSA Center for Substance Abuse Prevention uh, graduated fellow. With that, I give you Dr. Patricia Q. Boston. Thank you so much, Jamoya, and thank you for the opportunity to um, have this conversation with yourself and uh, the team, um, Scott and Simone, and I look forward to even further uh, conversation beyond this. And thank you for those who have um, joined us today. In the picture on this slide, um, I put this lighthouse because the class standards is something like that. It's kind of like a light to show us how we can implement cultural and linguistically appropriate services um, in terms of these standards. And with sometimes when we talk about cultural and linguistic competency, where the question always comes up, well, how do you do it? Well, the class standards kind of like brighten the way because they give us uh, these particular standards and ideas on how to implement um, these services. So. Um, and I'm going to talk about the Florida experience from a multi-level approach. Um, Scott kind of um, talked about that when he talked about the diversity of that uh, uh, diversity team there in Ohio. Um, that this was a, a group of diverse people from different um, levels of work in our field. And so that is the work in Florida, I find ourselves. Um, working uh, with a multitude of levels um, that are a part of the mental health system here. So I'm going to kind of try to present um, the Florida experience in that way. OK, so the, um, just, ooh, ooh, let's go back. OK, just to recap some of uh, what Jamoya shared with us earlier. The intention of the, the class standards are to, to advance health equity, to improve quality of our work, and to help to eliminate health care disparities. He shared with us that there were four standards, or actually um, four themes, with one, three themes with one principal standard, and, um, and each theme, there are a number of standards. And so in theme two, which is governance, leadership, and workforce, there are three standards. And then we have theme four, excuse me, two and three, uh, which have a number of other standards. But we're going to focus today on theme one, as Jamoya shared earlier, which is governance, leadership, and workforce. And excuse me as I'm learning, I'm figuring out how to operate my clicker here. So what is common to all states who are implementing class standards? What is common to all the states implementing class standards is that they have practices, they have facilitating factors, they have barriers, and they have resources or assistance that they need. However, every state also has their own particular practices, their own unique facilitating factors, and their own set of barriers and their own set of ideas of what they, they feel they need to continue implementing the class standards. So what is unique about this conversation is that we get to talk um, and learn about what's unique to Florida's contextual reality as it relates to implementing the national class standards of C1. So 
what is the Florida contextual reality? And this is what um, my work lies in. It sits in this, this kind of framework. Um, I work um, expanding something called the Florida Children's Mental Health System of Care um, Expansion Project. And our state in Florida is broken up into regions. And there's six of them. And this is what it looks like from the Northwest region all the way down to the Southern region. We have regional directors in these regions. We have state directors in, the, in, in these regions. And we also have managing entities. So the, in terms of the multiple levels of work, of the work of expanding the class standards in which I sit in, these are all of the different levels that I interact with. But the main thing to get here is that this is a snapshot of the six regions in Florida. And I have five expansion states in five of these regions. Here again, so where is the effort that I'm working on coming from to implement the class standards in Florida and actually come from a variety of arenas or a multitude of levels? And the initiative I work with is coming from the Children's Mental Health System of Care. That's that acronym, CMHSOC, the Children's Mental Health System of Care. That's where I sit at. But I'm surrounded about, I'm surrounded by um, what you saw in the previous map and these other uh, entities. Uh, the bigger picture is the Florida Department of Children and Families. And then I sit in the Office of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. Um, directing this program um, of system of care expansion. In addition, um, we have five, the five regions, which I talked about, we have five regional system of care, regional coordinators. Those system of care coordinators have pulled together five coordinating councils in each of those regions. And in each of those regions, we have five cultural and linguistic competency representatives who are responsible for expanding class standards in those regions. And then we also have family and youth coordinators in each of those five regions. In addition, we have a state advisory team for the overall system of care expansion project. And then we have a state CLC, or cultural and linguistic competency committee. Um, in addition, what's not listed here is we also have a state cultural and linguistic competency planning team. Um, and then finally, we have a state family and youth con consortium inside of this in addition. And this is just trying to get you, the, get, get you to have the feeling of the multiple layers or levels that are involved in um, this type of initiative that I'm trying to um, draw a picture of in your mind, because it's a statewide expansion. So we also have, and we're lucky to have evaluators. We have um, a wraparound training team, and wraparound is the evidence-based practice that we use um, uh, to expand our system of care here in Florida. And then we also have a family and youth organization that helps us engage the families and youth of those being served in our mental health, health um, system. You know the class standards already, and we'll just um, go through these really, really briefly. Um, and that's, there's three of them that we'll talk about today. And I'll actually try to share with you what we've done, uh, what our practices are in each of these standards. Um, but this first one, this first one, which is actually standard number two, advanced, sustained governance and leadership that promotes class and health equity. It's, it really can be challenging because in a state agency where there are so many set priorities that come um, from a hierarchy, sometimes they may not be congruent with um, cultural and linguistic competence. So the work becomes one of helping others to comprehend the important, importance of implementing the national class standards and how to implement them. So the third standard, which is around recruitment and promoting and, and um, recruitment, promotion, and support, support to, supporting a diverse governance and leadership and workforce. Um,
it is um, related to Just one second. Just one second. I lost my place in the slide. Okay, and the purpose of that one is to create an environment in which culturally diverse individuals feel welcomed and valued, um, and to promote trust and engagement with the communities and populations served. So we'll. We'll talk about how that happens in Florida as well. And then finally, the fourth standard, um, which has that purpose to prepare and support a workforce that demonstrates the attitudes, knowledge, and skills necessary to work effectively with diverse populations, and also to increase the capacity of staff to provide services that are culturally and, culturally and linguistically appropriate. We'll talk about that as well, how we, how we do that. And we'll talk about it in terms of current practices. So these are the practices here that align with the national class standards in Florida, governance, leadership, and workforce. And um, the first, um, um, and this correlates to the second standard, um, leadership structure. In Florida, um, we have a Department of Children and Families vision, mission, and goals. And that vision, mission, and goals actually um, has some of the terminology of, um, that we, we expect to have in a culturally and linguistically appropriate um, um, uh, strategic plan. So some of the words include things like protect the vulnerable, um, also be ethically, socially, and culturally responsible. So we have that that supports um, that particular standard. We also have a CLC, a cultural and linguistic strategic plan development process, and we finally have our uh, strategic plan, and we'll look at that in a minute. Um, we also have been able to link the block grant CLC requirements to the system of care CLC. So I, I don't know, I think in, most states have a block grant, and inside that block grant are particular requirements. So we, in the system of care, um, expand our CLC in that way, so we're able to serve in terms of the entire um, block grant funding to be a part of um, and engage that funding to be a part of expanding class standards in the state. And then finally, we have a grant unit in our department. And in that grant unit, we have a number of um, federally funded grants. One is the launch program, and one is the healthy transitions program. And each of those programs have a cultural and linguistic uh, competency component and mandate. So we're able to, from the system of care, um, connect with those grants to ensure that they're functioning accordingly. And finally, in terms of leadership structures, we in Florida have a governor's um, executive order that recently came out. We call it Order 15-175. And this uh, executive order is calling for an assessment of all of the mental health services in um, three counties, and one of those counties is a county in which we have a system of care expansion project and a CLC representative. So we're linking with that executive order to make sure um, cultural and linguistic competency is also included in that assessment. And the, the reason for that assessment is because we figured out that there's a need for increased coordination of mental health services in the state and um, particularly um, among agencies as well. And uh, the Department of Juvenile Justice is one of the agencies. So we're trying to coordinate and those, those services and um, get them to work in together more. In terms of champions, one of the things that this class um, standards shared with us is that um, you can, you can um, expand this this standard by engaging champions um, in, in this. So we have been able to, um, through our planning team, our statewide CLC planning team, engage champions in the state. Those people who are part of that team are cultural and linguistic competency experts throughout the state in those located in those different regions. So we've been able to galvanize them, bring them together so that they can actually 
um, strategize, and one of the results is our statewide CLC strategic plan. Next, we have those regional CLC representatives. One person is not able to be everywhere in the system. And keep in mind, I didn't mention this early, but the work that I do is system change work. So it's not um, the work that I'm doing is actually not providing services, but trying to create the system where class standards are being operationalized and utilized. So those CLC representatives who I've worked with and um, helped to, to increase their understanding and knowledge of class standards, they work in all of those regions. There's five of them. And they, become, they have become uh, regional CLC leaders and they work to help the providers in those regions understand implementation of class standards. And then we have the real, uh, and we also have um, in those regions, two of the regions decided they wanted to start their own regional CLC committee. So they have teams of people in those regions who are working to implement class standards. And then finally, um, um, we have a, a statewide person that's kind of galvanizing that and bringing that all together. That's myself. But um, finally, we have, we're lucky in the state of Florida to have the site of one of the National System of Care T CLC technical assistance hubs. And those um, leaders there, um, they're located in Tampa, Florida. They were part of our statewide um, CLC team. And then finally, in that second, um, standard um, in policies and practices, um, we've been able to change our contract language. Um, so we have the language of system of care, the language of cultural and linguistic competency inside of our contracts. Um, here again, we've developed this uh, statewide CLC strategic plan, which we'll look at in one second. Um, and we've been able to get our evaluators. I mentioned earlier that we have an evaluators that are part of our team. They have been conducting uh, CLC assessments in providers with providers in those regional areas sites. So they are in the process um, at the beginning of this year. We'll conduct a CLC assessment of our state office, and this will be the first time this has ever been done. So we're really excited about that. Don't know what we're going to find, but um, it'll be a good move because you have to know, as Scott is doing with his work team, they're trying to figure out what they have. They're looking at the demographics, and they're looking at what they have before they can actually say, this is what we need to do. So it's a good step. And also in terms of policies and practices, our um, grants from uh, SAMHSA are required to have what's called a behavioral health impact statement. So with this, we've been able to um, uh, get some of the leaders in the development of these statements to uh, conduct a webinar so that we can train our CLC representatives and, le and leadership in the state on how to, um, how to uh, develop and build and write these behavioral health impact statements because they become valuable not only for SAMHSA, but also for our regional and local work because they give us important information about our populations of focus. Um, so this here is a logic model of our statewide CLC strategic plan. And this was put together by our state committee, our state CLC committee. And as you can see on the top, we have our vision our CLC vision, our mission, and our values. And the vision is equity and behavioral health for all children, youth, and families in Florida. Then also we talk a little bit on the left about our context, where we are now, you know, areas of improvement. You know, the whole idea is that we want to identify and use, um, uh, use uh, state resources effectively, you know, um, and then in the middle here, we have our core strategies. How are we going to do that? You know, and these are the five, the four strategies. We're going to actually generate statewide awareness. And we've been doing that in a number of ways. And to integrate CLC and system of care values and principles into all services um, and supports based on class. So finally, this is what our expected, this is what our outputs. Um, um, for this time period are. 
and then um, what our overall impact is the elimination of behavioral health disparities for all Florida children, and then evaluation of this all the way through. And then this here is just telling you, it's just outlining our goals in a, a different kind of way and our values, but it's pretty much similar to the uh, logic model. We talk about our vision and our values and our mission, you know, what our mission is. Um, and the state committee um, promotes the achievement of positive behavioral health outcomes for children, youth, and families in Florida through holistic implementation and promotion of system of care values. We seek the elimination of behavioral health disparities among all children in Florida using the most effective and efficient continuum of services available. So you can see um, here in our um, strategic plan, the class standards are in table to it. And then finally, in terms of current practices, um, looking at standards three and four, um, we have um, collaboration with local universities and to provide CLC intern opportunities for students of public health, social work, health care administration. We um, have um, links to our CLC committee to students, master level students and doctoral level students. And these students come to us to get experience in system of care expansion. But they also get experience in cultural and linguistic competency expansion. So usually when we engage them, we make sure that there is a product as the outcome of their semester's worth of work. Uh, for example, one, we've developed, we develop a number of CLC materials. Um, and one of the outcomes was a CLC level two brochure because we already have a level one. And then the other thing is we teach these students how to write a behavioral health impact statement. So um, we think um, in terms of furthering the workforce, we think that this is really important. So we put um, some effort towards being a part of this. Um, also, in terms of education and training and collaboration, we work with the Office of Civil Rights. And we share CLC materials with them. We share our webinars with them. Any type of training opportunities we share with the, the, the offices of the Civil Rights um, the, uh, Department. The reason why we do that in the state of Florida, we have um, civil rights compliance officers. And their job is to go around to all of the regions and the providers to do a um, check compliance check. And part of their compliance check is a language, um, language and also cultural competency. So we figured if we collaborate with them, we could work together. And it's been a really good uh, partnership. So we share our brochures with them. And when they go out into the field, they're able to deliver those brochures to the providers that um, they actually go to observe. Um, also, we have in Florida the Florida Certification Board. This board, we've developed a few uh, cultural and linguistic competency courses with them that are offered online, so if, and they're free of charge. So if, uh, we can refer providers to go uh, and take those courses, and they get uh, credits. They get um, continuing ed credits, and they also get a certification at the end. And the last course that we developed with them was how to create your personal CLC action plan. So um, they're very important to the work we do in terms of educating, training, and collaborating. And then finally, um, we, co we try our best to connect with local health issues. For example, we work with a number of physicians out of uh, Florida State University on a committee to engage um, clinicians in uh, the childhood obesity um, prevention initiative. And that's important to system of care because we also want those physicians to understand system of care. And we get an opportunity in that framework, and we get an opportunity to also help them to understand um, ways of implementing um, class standards in their operation. Um, 
And then factors that support and promote implementation. And it, these are them. Um, leadership. The leadership helps us because the connections to upper level leadership, regional leadership, as I shared with you in the beginning, those are our inroads to working with providers. Um, leadership of the managing entities and those are the people who actually are providing um, the mental health services in the state of Florida. So it's through those leadership that we're able to operate and expand this kind of approach um, and expand um, the use of class standards. Um, another factor supporting and promoting implementation is the system of care expansion project. Through this project, we get to work on that system. It, because it's a system change project, we get to do that as our work. And I think that um, you know, having this um, project, this expansion system change project, um, um, we're able to have a great reach because that is our purpose. Um, we have a state CLC coordinator, um, and that person can really focus on um, expansion of the class standards. And that helps us a lot in terms of promoting implementation of class standards. Um, we talked about the health disparities, the behavioral health disparities impact statement requirements. That has got us a lot of attention. Uh, people are calling because they're applying for these grants and they have to have this, health, this behavioral health disparities impact statement. So that gives us an opportunity to introduce them to class standards and get them to write class standards into their statements. National link to, link to leaders in CLC and class, and that has helped us in terms of, you know, who are the go-to people when you have questions about implementation, and you need even training for your state, and these people have been very helpful in that. Contractual requirements, I shared earlier that we've been able to put um, CL, uh, class standards CLC into our contract, and we're going to work on that even more in depth in this year coming up. Um, having the local uh, CLC training hub here, all they have the access to the resources, so we're able to kind of put our hands on them and get that re re those resources and um, information from them. The experts in the state, uh, Florida is very diverse. There are people here from so many different places in the world, and each county even has their own particular um, uh, characteristics in terms of uh, demographics and diversity. So that helps us a lot. And those regional representatives that are in those areas, that helps us to know those populations of focus and begin to engage them in helping us to know how to best, you know, serve them. So, and then we have also, um, and lastly I'll say, we have the Florida Auxiliary Plan. And this auxiliary plan has, um, and it goes to all of our regions, it goes to all of our regional directors and those folks who work in those offices and our providers. And in this document, it has a list of translators and interpreters all over the state, not just their names, but their phone numbers and contacts and emails as well. And in our system, everyone that works in our system has to sign off that they receive that document. So that um, helps and promotes um, implementation of the class standards in our state. Um, barriers, competing workload, um, working in a state system, there is so, it's so tedious and the, the workload is, is humongous. And in the office that I work in, just a little bit before I came, they actually downsized the number of people. So, um, you know, having a competing workload, which impacts your time. Then the transition of leadership. Um, when leadership changes, it's almost like having to start all over again. And we've had a lot of um, staff turnover and transition of leadership. So that can be a barrier, or it can slow down the progress. Um, priority setting. You know, what's the most important thing right now? And a project like expanding system of care, this and, and a project like this, there's so many different components of it. So what has to be done first? Um, I have to make sure the budget is done in order to be able to do the next thing. So those uh, priority setting. And then um, lack of a team of people at the state level working on class implementation. You know, you need more than one person. 
Um, Scott has a whole team, that diversity team. I'm real jealous of that. But you do need a team. It takes a team. And it's hard to expand class standards across a whole state with just one person. And then finally, if I look at, um, if we look at the assistance or the needs that we have here, um, I'll, I'll go back to those barriers, increased number of staff, increased funding for CLC materials. You know, we produce some materials, but we need many more materials so that when we're gone, these materials are left in these agencies. Currently, we have a number of posters, cultural and linguistic competency posters that help um, deal with the language access. We have brochures, but we need more uh, materials um, in order to help us to expand our class standards. And then finally, increased strategizing and support from upper level leadership. We're working on this, um, but that's a, um, it doesn't happen overnight, and that's a process that we're working on now. So those would be the, in terms of assistance needed, the things I would talk about. Any questions? Well, thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Boston, for such a comprehensive presentation on <clears throat> just some great work going on in Florida. Um, a number of things resonated with me, um, and, and certainly when you got to the barriers, being as, working for a state agency, I certainly understood some of those challenges that you're experiencing in Florida. Uh, but I also noticed that in, in your presentation, a lot of things applicable to local uh, agencies who who are represented even on this call, and that is the work that you've done with collaboration, um, even to the extent with partnering with community advocates, youth, and even reaching out to uh, universities, um, looking at your contracts, and even organizational assessments, those things that are applicable to the local level, and also including uh, uh, senior staff or leadership in the work that you do. So this, this was very good. I hope that um, the people on the call really took some good notes because I, I see the application in your work. So I will go and see what questions we have now for you in this for your presentation. Okay. Okay, this is a question <clears throat> from Natasha Curtis. Who can support the group in determining how quality and language access is directly linked to access? Safety and ROI, I believe. So she's asking who can support the group? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, to answer that, I would say, you know, for me, I think outside the box. So I'm thinking about, I, I work in a big agency, the Department of Children and Families. And in this agency, there's so many different offices or departments, which you could call them. So in that regard, I reach out to those different offices to find out how I can connect what I'm, and this is a strategy that I use, how I can connect what I'm doing to what they're doing. So in terms of, as well as outside of the agency, but in terms of language, the, the Office of Civil Rights actually has mandates regarding language. So all of my language, um, not all of them, much of my language resources come from that office. And I think most cities have them. And because um, there, are federal, um, there are federal laws that mandate certain kinds of um, support for language access, I go to them for that. In terms of statistics, now, they have the LEP language um, um, uh, website is language LEP, and you can Google LEP.org, and all kinds of language assistance resources are on that website. So I use those folks a lot as well. And just, I answered just that to, question. And, and just to kind of add on, I know one of the things that we we are looking at to actually address language access and quality is here at the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, for example, we have been working with the deaf community and we're 
you know, we know that there's a, a bigger issue around language access and competency. But one of the things that we're doing is working directly with the deaf community, working with advocates, working with uh, individuals that serve uh, agencies, uh, individuals that are deaf. And so right now we're looking at some really good um, workforce strategies to um, actually help us engage interpreters out in the field because we know in many states like, like Ohio that we don't really have any specific standards around um, language certification. So right now we're building um, kind of some advocacy partnerships in order to kind of get the group necessary to help us um, look at how do we en enhance that. And that includes engaging um, the various interpreters across the state. Some uh, interpreters have uh, credentials, some don't. And so we have to determine multiple ways of engaging them. And so that's one of the things that we're doing as a state agency to address that. Um, now I want to turn uh, this part of the, of the uh, presentation over to uh, Simone Crawley with the Multi-Ethnic Advocates for Cultural Competency. Uh, MAC has been um, a, a great partner and um, with the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services for many years. Um, we have really entrusted with them to really link up with the community on identifying specific key strategies to move our system towards health equity. But another thing that we've really worked with them on and um, really looked to contract with them on is training. And so in addition to training to do other things, I want to give it over to uh, Simone to kind of talk about what that looks like. Thank you, Jamoya. And I also want to say thank you to Director Silak and Dr. Boston for your efforts in your uh, uh, both in the Toledo area and down in Florida. Uh, so as Jamoya mentioned, MAC has sort of been charged with this work of ensuring that our health systems are providing culturally competent care. Um, as you can see, our mission is to enhance the quality of care in Ohio's health systems and incorporate culturally competent models of practice into the systems and organizations that provide services to Ohio's diverse population. So as Dr. Boston mentioned, we are really about the work of getting down into true organizational change and change across systems. And as we all know with this work of cultural competence, it's a process. It's a lifelong process, truly. None of us are going to participate in webinars or training sessions um, once or twice a year and be proficient. Um, and so that's something that we always want to continue to reiterate um, in the work that we do here at MAC. And then again, as Dr. Boston mentioned, uh, then the question becomes, how do you do that? Um, and so with MAC, we do that in multiple ways, as Jamoya mentioned. Um, our crux of the work that we do is in our training products, and we have several of those, two of which I'm going to focus on here. Our CARE Ohio training is sort of our really standard baseline uh, training session to really talk about what is culture, what is diversity, and to start looking at those terms uh, in a much more comprehensive manner than we're typically used to. Um, to really define those more broadly, to get your mind kind of thinking about the idea of culture diversity, cultural competence, uh, much more comprehensively and beyond just ideas around maybe race or ethnicity. And so that's a three-hour training session um, that we provide for uh, health departments and state agencies. Uh, we also have our class trainings um, that we do, which is another three-hour session. And the idea behind the class sessions is that if you, and we've all looked, taken a look at the um, enhanced standards, and they're very um, difficult for someone who maybe isn't as familiar with this work as we are to work through and to begin to implement. Um, it's very easy to look at those and be intimidated and not really know where to start. Um, sort of how um, Director Silak mentioned, um, at the same token, it can really kind of get you to understand how to move your agency forward in that way. And so in our, in our three-hour session, uh, we really go through real-life examples, uh, depending on which agency it is that we're contracting with, to work with the staff, to work with the executive level, to say um, standard by standard, theme by theme, what are some real ways that are related to the work that you're doing in your agencies that we can come up with today that you can take with you um, to begin this implementation phase. And so we've been uh, doing that across the state with some agencies and, and seeing some really good results from that. 
We also, as the slide mentioned, we sponsor lectures, educational sessions. Uh, MAC conducts an annual statewide conference each year. Uh, we just had our conference this past September. Dr. Vivian Jackson of Georgetown, as well as Dr. Billy Vaughn, were our two keynote speakers at the two-day conference. Um, for next year's conference, we're, also, we're actually looking to partner with um, the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services to do a more research-focused conference, talking about research around um, health disparities and issues um, related to the lack of um, accurate data being collected or the methods in which, in which the data is currently be con being collected across the state. So that's something that we're looking to do next fall. We also participate um, in, a, in assessment tools and cultural audits for agencies. Um, we can also tailor training curriculum um, to certain state agencies that may have that specific request. MAC also hosts a resource library at our agency um, that, can, that is very comprehensive and that we would welcome any additions to our resource library as well, but that's also a resource that we have. And so we really continue to uh, want to streamline the work that we're doing. Part of the work that we do does involve the faith community. Um, with regard to our MAC conference, we always have a track that focuses on the faith community um, as a faith track. And we also have the Ohio team, which is a statewide body that we've convened. Um, we have about five regions represented right now on the Ohio team. And they're all sort of doing independent work in areas of the state, but we come together once a month to talk about best practices moving forward. Um, from the Ohio team was born a, a number of initiatives as well. Um, we also work with Tracy Blackfall of Tova's Nest on a lot of our faith-based initiatives, um, including mental health first aid for clergy, which is something that we've done this year. Um, and, and Tracy Blackfall is a certified trainer in mental health first aid, and that's a national initiative that's recently been rolled out. Uh, again, we work with OMAS on the DAC Advisory Committee as well as the Research Advisory Team. MAC also always wants to encourage people to participate in the work that we're doing. Uh, there's two ways to do that. One is by becoming a MAC member, and you can find our membership levels on the website, which is MAC, M-A-C-C, I-N-C, dot net. And you can find all of our information there. Another way to participate in our work is through our board of directors. We're always looking for um, new and diverse individuals to sit on our board. We're looking for diversity in terms of the industry, in terms of culture, and in terms of geography as well, because we are a statewide agency. Um, so those are sort of the, the focusing of MAC uh, recently. And um, again, we welcome all of your input and welcome you to participate in the work that we're doing. And again, that website is maccinc.net. My contact information is there as well as our administrative assistant and our interim executive director. And I can take any questions. Are there any questions for Simone? Any questions? Uh, for Dr. Boston or Director Silek. Just wanted to share some upcoming things happening. Certainly, I, I thank Simone for that um, great presentation on the services that MAC provides. Um, certainly, as I listened, I, you know, I thought about the whole idea that really there's no reason for any of us to kind of go at this alone. Um, there's, we have too many resources in place. Uh, certainly uh, MAC provides a number of services that can help kind of guide and, and strengthen an organization's ability to kind of move in that direction. Um, and certainly we're doing uh, quite a few things to kind of move the system in that direction as well. One of the things that we're going to continue to do at this point um, is convene our Disparities in Cultural Competency Advisory Committee. Um, our next meeting is scheduled for Thursday, January 21st uh, from 10 to 12 p.m. Um, that committee provides oversight for our five-year, our 2020 strategic plan, our visioning. Um, one of the major things I, I could say, just to name a few things that we've been managed, managing to do, 
uh, with that specific uh, uh, plan is uh, one of the first things we did with, you know, was a first for our state agency was to incorporate health equity language into our grants management system. Um, it's something that really, you know, came at the best time because we were actually currently revamping that system and it allowed us to incorporate language into the system so that when applicants apply for specific funding, they would have to speak to and answer a series of questions that kind of helped to, uh, give us an idea whether or not they understood what health equity was, what disparities were impacting the, the population, the service area in question, and what are their intents to kind of respond to those specific needs. Uh, so we were really um, happy to be able to incorporate that. We also have a kind of a reporting mechanism for getting at are they in fact, um, are we seeing change with respect to the disparities that were identified uh, early on in the application process. So we're really happy with that. Dr. Boston talked a little bit about um, collecting research and so did Simone and one of the things that came out of this report also with respect to our data research and evaluation area was convening a research and advisory committee. And so that group is composed of researchers all across the state um, and they're really helping us to look at and identify specific um, things that they may be doing or others may be doing, programs, intervention, promising practices that we could cross-pollinate across the system. So this is a very, very important group and we're actually working with them also uh, to, convince, to develop this conference for uh, next year as well. So the DAC Advisory Committee will continue to meet. Right now it meets um, maybe once or twice a quarter. Um, we also have coming up um, our business case for promoting uh, equity um, and that's around the business case that was developed that uh, Scott Salek had mentioned before um, earlier. Um, and again, that business case really gets at two things. It's really changing the narrative. To change the narrative from we understand that in many respects it's the right thing to do to address this work, uh, but also it goes a step beyond that. It looks at costs. What are the, some of the excess expenditures that we're seeing um, as a result of disparities or inequities? Um, what are some of the disparities that we're seeing um, in folks receiving services, outcomes, um, and diagnosis? So, so this business case kind of provides more specific information. It provides the teeth for communicating what the key issues are that we're trying to really address um, through uh, health equity issues. Um, we also um, are looking at continuing this uh, disparities in cultural competency learning community. Um, and with that, uh, the next uh, learning community is going to focus on youth and young adults. And that's scheduled for Wednesday, February the 17th. And it's, it's one of several uh, learning community events. We've already done a training on the Amish culture, which was very good. Uh, bridges Out of Poverty. Um, the next two to follow youth and young adults is going to focus on historical trauma and disproportionate minority contact. Um, we also look to hopefully do a theme two with respect to uh, the enhanced class standards and maybe offer that on tentatively March, Tuesday, March the 8th from 2 to, two to 4. And last but not least, we're contracting with MAC uh, for a second cohort for the uh, regional enhanced class standards, and that's to be determined. We're going to offer those probably maybe in sometime between April and June. So that is still to be determined. Um, I think um, that brings us to a close. I see um, no more questions uh, for our um, panelists, our participants, or our pre presenters. Um, if you would like, I will send out the PowerPoints to all of you that participated today so that you could have that for your information. Um, if you would like to reach out to any of the presenters um, and you would like their contact information, please email me at jamoya .cox at mha.ohio.gov. Again, that's jamoya.cox at mha ohio.gov or you can give me a call. My number is 614-728-5687. Um, I think that brings our presentation to an end. Thank you for joining me. Uh, my hope is that we can continue to send information 
out to the um, COC network to keep you kind of informed on things coming going on. Um, if you would like for us or Max to participate in anything going on with your local agencies, please contact us uh, so that we can connect with you regarding that. Uh, with that, you have a nice day and look up, look out for, for more information on upcoming events. Thank you.